Okay, uh, welcome and thank you for coming out this afternoon. Uh, I want to say thank you to Paula and ARC for extending a second invitation to be able to present this topic of delivering value through instrument reliability program. I think Kevin really set this, the, ta the stage for us um, in terms of talking about the culture change that's really needed to drive reliability improvements across your facility. And so today's presentation is kind of two phase. The first phase is really going to talk about um, how do we create the organizational change needed to drive those improvements? You know, what was the operating discipline uh, needed? What was the work processes that were needed to kind of sustain gains from reliability improvements? And then the second part of the presentation is really going to be about some of the case studies or the specific examples that we use technology to help solve some of these problems. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get right into it. Um, so why are we here today? Yep. I look back four years ago as we started our reliability journey. One of the first things that we actually instituted within the engineers and the technician is that uh, we are not just a maintenance organization. We're not just here in the plant to provide a service, but we are actually we're our own company, right? And so we call ourselves technical representatives for the technology or for the discipline. And so by me going or approaching it that way, we're starting to get into the mindsets of the personnel that's working on reliability. So this represents, on the left hand side, represents our actual logo to kind of showcase where we would get actually started in driving these reliability improvements. So on the left hand side, uh, you have the instrument element and the number five represents the five technologies that we're focused in on, uh, pressure, level, temperature, flow, and control valve. Uh, the number 34,000 represents all of the IO points that we had scattered across our site. Uh, the reliability element, the number eight, represents the eight pillars or the eight services that we offered for our clients. And 365 it just shows that we're focused on reliability every day of the year. And so before we actually, so as, as technical representatives, we want to make sure we get a chance to work on the fun stuff, uh, get our hands dirty, understand technology. But as a, a leader in reliability, you want to make sure you understand what the current mindset is so that you can be able to strive for culture change. Okay, and so that was the initial step is really approaching what we do as a maintenance organization uh, into more of a, we're our own company, our own business. Instead of the maintenance staff, we are instrument technical services, right? And so we got our logo, we have shirts printed up. And so now what, what we're doing here is we're building momentum into uh, what the following slides are gonna talk about is the 85% reduction in reactor trips or in Dow's case, we call these unplanned events, okay? And so we try to also relate what we're doing in reliability in terms of dollar savings so that you can continue to drive that momentum all the way through the leadership ranks. Okay, so a little bit about uh, the facility we implemented this program in. It's actually Deer Park, Texas. Um, Deer Park is, well, that, that organization produces acrylic acid and we're the largest uh, participant in the acrylic monomers marketplace. The facility actually sits on uh, the Houston Ship Channel and it's uh, about 700 acres of property. And within that area, we have 67 process units. Now some of the products that we make there are adhesives, coatings, inks, textiles, polymers, and super absorbents. Uh, one thing I wanna highlight in this uh, particular facility just before we implemented our program is right around 2011 is when I started working at that plant. And in those conditions, if you look at the economy and the environment, we're actually in sold out conditions. And so reliability was one of the key focus points for the entire site. I mean, it, was, it had gotten to the point where every single drop that you could get from a pipe could be sold. And so the leadership wanted to make sure that we, in each of our disciplines, had a specific focus on how we would drive that reliability. And to kind of set the stage of what the opportunity was when we got started, um, so I have about 11 years of experience across multiple manufacturing industries. And one of the first things that I've learned as being a leader within your discipline is always good to showcase what the case for change is. You know, you always want to document what the, uh, the bottom line looks like. And so in our case, this pictorial represents where we identify the biggest bang for the buck. Okay, if you look at across the whole site, there was five units or five reactors that accounted for nearly half of the downtime for the entire plant. Okay, so obviously that opportunity was our low-hanging fruit, 
and that's where we designed or drafted our reliability program. Um, the one thing I've also learned is you want to try to drive quick solutions uh, so that you can continue to build off of that momentum. And in our case, those five reactors all had the same or similar manufacturing process technology. And so if we implemented a solution in one reactor, it was easy to leverage it across the other four uh, reactors. And so we got the biggest bang for the buck. We understand where we can solve problems quickly. And so we also want to make sure that our management team, leadership team, understands that this is the return on the investment that you're going to get back. Okay. So just to kind of fast forward a couple of years, give you guys a status of where we stand. Um, so the first year, we started 2011, about 50 percent. Within the next year, we made a significant step change in, uh, in terms of the instrument reliability across the site, down to 16 percent. Okay. And then the next year, we got down to the single digit numbers. So this just validates that the model, the system that we put in play, um, in terms of some of the culture change, some of the reliability improvements, uh, we're still intact and we're still sustaining the gains year over year. And like I mentioned before, you know, it's important to be able to document where you stand today. So when you have those, those discussions with your management team, you say, we have actually made success towards our goal. And so now you're starting to see that return on your investment. So going back to really uh, the preliminary stages of the development of the, the model or the program. Um, as I mentioned, I've had the luxury to work for different companies. And one company that I worked for was a real component of lean manufacturing. And so I got a chance to really understand uh, stuff like Kaizen, which is the Japanese word for continuous improvement. And so as an as a electrical engineer by trade, instrument and controls engineer, I understood where some of the challenges lie within the facility. But I've also learned that it's important to get the voice of the customer before you really start implementing things right away. Okay, so within the first couple months, uh, with me being on the site, we sat down with our leadership and management team, and we, we, we went through a week-long discussion. We locked everybody up in a room, and we, uh, to summarize everything, we asked one simple question. So what are your needs? You know, you give us the data, you give us the information to be able to pinpoint where you think or what you think success looks like. Okay, and they came back and kind of said simply, we need reliability strategies and we need immediate improvements. And so for a reliability engineer, for me that translates into we need to stop the bleeding, but we also need to move towards a more reliable centered culture. Okay, so there's a lot of brainstorming that came from those discussions. And uh, obviously we couldn't work on everything, but we decided to really identify the key areas that would be easier, easier, either easier to implement or we would have resources readily available to start execution. Okay, so we kind of prayed out all of those ideas and we labeled them as challenges. Okay, so that was our front end loading to creating what you're going to see in our reliability model, uh, which are, these are some of the services that we were uh, able to offer our clients. Um, don't have enough time to go through all of them today, but uh, give you some examples. One of the first things that we did was the infrastructure. And so obviously, in order to make a real step change in that reliability program, you had to have the right people at the ground level to be able to execute, okay? So one of the things that we instituted was, in, in, in the Deer Park facility, all of the i &E technicians came from a central pool of maintenance, okay? So keep this in mind. If I'm a technician, I come to work, and I get a work order, I go to work in plan A one day. But then the next day I get a batch of work orders to go work in plant B and then plant C and then bouncing around the site. And so how do I really gain a sense of ownership if I'm moving from one area to the next area? So one of the first things we did is, is create a centralized group and or broke up the centralized group and made them specific to report to plant areas. And within that, that pool of resources, we had certain key folks that were uh, at a higher skill set and we promoted them to what we call reliability technician. So half of their time was focused on the firefighting. The other half of their time was focused on the reliability improvements and some of the things I'm going to talk about in the coming slides. Okay, so one example of the services we provided was we call them trip investigations. So within that first year, of course, we had a history of unplanned events. We knew we we're going to probably get more unplanned events. But what we're going to change here is how do we document, how do we solve some of those problems? And we either did a formal RCI, root cause investigation, or informal. So, I mean, that's something we've always done throughout the years. The trick here is 
we train the technician to do their own preliminary investigations so that they can front end load to some of the longer term solutions. Uh, the next one is instrument status. This is going to relate more to the remote monitoring. Uh, we had a homegrown system that basically a red, yellow, and green light status indicator on some of our critical instruments, and we'll talk a little bit about those as well. Um, the third element was the visual assessments. And so one of the feedback that we got from the leaders was that all of our instruments really have poor health and condition. And when we asked them, what does that mean? How do you measure poor health and condition? And so we decided to do something in that space, and I'm going to talk about that one as well. Uh, the next one is equipment maintenance strategies. This is more of a mechanical lined uh, approach to uh, solving reliability challenges. But in our case, we decided to use uh, a strategy for control valves. And as a part of having smart positioners or smart devices, we actually use the diagnostics information to solve problems. Uh, next is top opportunity list. Or as Kevin mentions, we had a, a bad actors list. We went after the repeat offenders within our, within our plant. And so all of those elements fed into the final one, which is capital projects. And we got all of the information uh, to front end load projects versus operations saying, hey, I think this is where we need to spend money. We gave them justification based upon our uh, reporting to be able to go and solve some of these challenges. OK, so uh, real quickly. Um, in terms of the OD, of what, how we're driving the culture change, one thing I've learned also is as engineers and leaders move throughout the company, if, if that engineer did a great job, then what happens is when they leave, it goes back to the way it was. And so we took that in consideration early on. And so we created like a 30-page document that says this is the strategy for implementing this program. And as a part of the strategy, we had a work process. Who, what, when, where, and how you're actually going to do those things so you can train new people. Okay. As a result, we had procedures. Uh, we also did investigation reports. We did a lot of documentation, but all of those things fed into the fifth step was execution. So you can do a great job in identifying root causes, but unless you actually go out and execute and fix the problem, then all that work was for naught. So that was the structure or our, our operating discipline. Uh, the next phase of the presentation is more about some of the success stories. And so the first one up is the control valve uh, maintenance strategy. If you notice, for a three-year period, we had an incline in reactor trips due to control valve technologies. And we simply said, what can we do to reduce these trips? Um, at a high level, I mean, we did a lot of things. But to kind of summarize, we paid more attention to assigning criticality values for all our instruments or control valves in, in the plant. Uh, we aligned them to PPM schedules. We actually, uh, so we knew that we would continually have trips and we're going to go away overnight, so we had spare parts in place for the critical valves. Uh, procedures were put into play, working with our vendors to make sure we had quality repairs done. And then in some cases, we had valves that were not actually in the right design condition, so we had to do some, uh, some capital projects for change outs. So we focused in on that the first year. Uh, on a couple of the trains, we begin to drive it across all of the reactors the next year. And we also infused the, the strategy with some of the more diagnostics uh, information that we got back. So now we can real time monitor those conditions of those critical valves and be able to respond to them more quickly. Um, so if I talk about the, the good things that we did with the strategy, got to talk about the bad. Uh, the, the reason why we have one red block there is that was the last train to receive all of the PMs. And so we were still waiting for the turnaround to be executed. And so, but this is actually a good data point because we fed that back into our management team and says when we implement strategies, this is the reason why we need to complete them, right? We don't need to leave, you know, 20% left over. We need to fully implement these things across the board. So just fasting forward, uh, last year was the best year that they've had regarding control valve technologies. And so we're sustaining success uh, year over year. So some examples of how we use the diagnostics information. Uh, this one particular valve is actually a part of the feed going into our reactor. Uh, one of our feedstocks is process air. And so it's connected to a governor valve that's on a steam turbine and compressor. And so we noticed that we got a triggered alert that came in on every time the valve would move above 40%. Okay? It came real erratic as the output would get above that level. And so we got the alert come in. We went and talked to operations and said, look, at some point, we need to take a look at this valve. And he said, well, I don't really want to stop the plant. I don't want to shut down the plant to just look at one valve. But let me get back to you. So he had a discussion with the business team. The business team came back and said, you know what? Our inventory levels are actually good right now. Uh, we have a planned outage coming up in the near future. 
why don't we keep the output of the valve at below 40% so we don't have an unplanned event? Okay, so within a few weeks, we actually had that, that planned outage, took the valve down, and coming to find out there was nothing actually mechanically wrong with inside the valve body, but it was a loose bracket connecting the actuator. And it was loose right around this valve stroke at 40%. So real quick, uh, simple repair, and we avoided a reactor trip just by having that dialogue with operations. Um, the second example, so the first one was more reliability, the second one is more maintenance costs and how we're using uh, these performance curves to be able to drive reduction in, in the spending. And so during turnarounds, what we actually do is perform these scans of the valve. Um, in this particular case, we had a valve that uh, the actuator di uh, differential pressure was throwing some stickage. So there's either something mechanically wrong on the inside of the valve or the feedback is not correct. And so this valve would have been pulled uh, so pipe fitters to remove the valve, you get a crane to lift it up, ship it off to a vendor to repair it, send it back, and repeat the whole process. But in this case, what we found out was the travel sensor was actually defective. So a couple hundred dollars versus a couple thousand dollars for the repairs. So as a result of doing these scans, uh, we removed 36% uh, of the valves from the turnaround scope and got to what I call cost avoidance. Uh, the reason why that's key there is because we can't necessarily claim all of that. We're able to say that we used $120,000 for another scope. So maybe our mechanical brothers and sisters needed to do some work on piping or rotating equipment, so they reallocated that money for a higher priority. So those are a couple examples how we're using the diagnostics. Um, so in terms of our visual assessments, so one thing I want to highlight on this slide is if you have all of this uh, smart information coming back and you're monitoring this remotely, it's a great tool. But you also got to focus on the basics. So the, this slide represents some pictures of what the basics look like. Okay, in the left-hand side, uh, you see a control valve with actuator on top. Uh, what's missing, what the arrow is pointing to is there's a, uh, I guess this is here, there's a vent cap on the top of that actuator that's not there. Okay, and what's happening just above the vent is you got a section of pipe that's collecting condensation, and the condensation is dripping into where that vent cap is supposed to be. So why is that a problem? If you look inside the actuator, and there's a puddle of water. Okay, so that issue is not going to cause a plant to trip today or tomorrow or next week, but at some point it's going to degrade the performance of the valve. Okay, next one here on the bottom, there's a solenoid package, and uh, here's a vent cap. Uh, the problem with this one is the vent cap is porous. It's supposed to be porous because it vents air off, but it's, it's facing upward, so as it rains, water gets inside of the solenoid package. So another example, it's not going to shut down today, tomorrow, but at some point, it's going to degrade the performance of the equipment. Uh, the one to the top right is uh, the highlighted area is a shipping plug installed on a limit switch. And if you notice, it's plastic. What happens is as we get those out of the box, we're supposed to take the plastic plug off and screw in a metal plug because plastic gets weathered over time. And you can faintly see the condensation starting to build up on the inside of the beacon here. Okay, so this is going to fill at some point. And then the final one is a, a temperature measurement. Uh, it's actually the low point of a conduit system, and there's no low point drain. So water at some point is going to make its way into conduit. I mean, we live in an environment where it rains. So Without having a proper installation here, look at what happens. It becomes a low point drain, and if you open up the cap inside, the uh, the wiring is completely corroded out. Okay, so if you have you know all the bells and whistles, nice diagnostics, that's great, but it needs to work in conjunction with uh, which is more I call a blocking and tackling program. The basics of what instrumentation is. Okay, because just so you can kind of see some results, we had 400 work orders that were created as a result of doing these assessments. Um, the next section, talk a little bit about condition monitoring. Uh, this was, like I said, a homegrown system that we use uh, through our DCS and our data historian. Uh, what we're doing in this case is monitoring our critical devices that are redundant. And so really simple mathematics looking at percent deviation between two or three transmitters. Okay, And because we have the deviation now, we can set that to a red or yellow status indicator. So these were a couple examples, and I'll just talk about one of them here. Uh, loose wiring connection on temperature transmitters, and so you, you probably can't read it. One of them reads about 70 degrees, the other one reads about 107. And so what, what happens is as the reactor is starting up, the temperature is ramping up in the process. So one of the temperature transmitters is actually stuck at ambient air, 
Okay, for my instrument guys in the, in, the, in, the, in the room know what that means. It's probably shorting out, reading the air, the air temperature around it. Um, in this case, the loose, uh, wire was loose and it was touching the housing. Okay, so if that ramp up would have continued to happen, that would have caused the reactor to trip because it would have been a perceived unsafe condition. Okay, so because we have these status indicators, we're able to, to in our case, we call it condition based. It's not smart diagnostics, it's just simple math. But the benefit of having this program is we could, we could look at hundreds of instruments in five minutes because the technician come in in the morning, they scan through their areas of the plant, everything is green, okay, I'm good to move on today. Okay, so just really quickly went through a couple of the examples of the case studies, but um, as a result of implementing those services, implementing kind of the culture change, the operating discipline there, uh, you kind of see the results, 85% in our uh, trip reduction or unplanned events uh, from an average of about 50 trips per four year period. Um, made a significant change after that first year, but what I'm most proud of, we continue to drive it year over year. Uh, the one last thing I want to say on this slide is, so I haven't worked at this facility in over a year, and so exactly what we said was going to happen, happened. An engineer left or a technician left, and with the program still stay intact. And I think because we did some of those early elements, the OD, the management systems, the culture change, we're able to still sustain the gains year over year. So uh, I know I'm running a little late, but these are some of the keys to success, just to kind of summarize things up. Uh, get the voice of the customer, which is very key before you start any improvement activity. Understand what the customer needs before you kind of push a solution down their throat. Uh, and they told us, hey, this is what we were looking for, reliability and short-term success. Um, also got to have a razor sharp focus. I mean, with, with so many unplanned events per year, it was very easy for us to get off target. But we said early on, these are the things that we're going to specifically work on and have as our goals for the year. Uh, and I'll, I put the quote, there will always be more good ideas than you have the capacity to execute. So that's why you need that focus as a leader or as a manager within your units. And then finally, uh, deliver results. I mean, you have the, the, the tools, you have the resources now, it's about the execution side. And in our case, we had uh, information that helped us become more database. Uh, we set up leading and lagging metrics as a part of our team, and we communicated that back to our reliability managers to let them know that, hey, we're either on target or we're off target, or hey, we need more support, we need more help. Um, so I think overall, um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm no longer there, but I, I keep tabs with some of the technicians that are working there. And I think we have significantly changed the mindset by our approach. And, um, and also, now we're in a position to start leveraging that across Dow. Um, so those are some of my, my major learnings, and I think I'm well over my time. But uh, thanks for having me.